Namo tassa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato asamma sambuddhassa Buddhang dhammang sankhang anutarang upajayang namasami The uh, chant we we did um, <coughs> for the puja, the Anapanasati uh, Sutta, the the words that are um, used over and over again is is he trains thus, and um, that's something I had mentioned in um, one of the morning reflections. That that sense of training. This is. Uh, the word is sika, and also a derivative of that is seka. Um, it's for the bhikkhu rules, we have 75 sekhyas, training rules. We have the, the eight precepts, which are often referred to as training precepts. So it's a word that um, we hear over and over again. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very good word because it's, it's quite unique to uh, the approach that the Buddha um, takes. And I don't, I don't, for example, see it so much in um, Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic teachings and in others, uh, it's just, this is a, a particular way that the, the Buddha taught in terms of training. Encouraged us to train our bodies, uh, our actions of body, mind, and speech. And so it's quite, it's quite helpful to reflect on that word training. Why did the Buddha uh, single that out as something that he was encouraging us in? To see that uh, the spiritual practice he was encouraging us to follow is, is a training. It's something that we are endeavoring to, to do um, that's keeping us in a particular direction. And it's something that implies that we're, we're practicing something over and over again. And we're, we're also taking something up, uh, intending to take something up uh, and work with it. And so we can think of the opposite word, untrained, or not taking a training up. And that, then we can see, oh, okay, that an untrained person, an untrained um, animal, or uh, a trained one. It's pretty obvious to me which one would rather be. Because training implies that not only has one um, gone and done something, uh, something in, in the realm that's a, a positive um, in the context we're speaking about right now, uh, uh, spiritual path, then that, that's, that's a movement towards something that's wholesome. And being untrained is a sense of, okay, either A, one could possibly be ignorant or not having taken up a training, or um, it implies possibly a coarseness or um, 
an untrained person would be someone who we might think in a worldly way is, is ill-mannered uh, or um, just ignorant of, of particular ways of behavior that are, are harmonious or particular etiquettes in a culture that are appropriate. And I, I remember um, Lumpur Pasano gave a talk. I can't remember uh, everything that was in the talk, but it was, it was uh, titled, Are You Ready to Train? And uh, it was quite a, yeah, it was quite a helpful uh, encouragement to us. Because th that question, are you ready to train, implies that uh, maybe, maybe one's not ready. Maybe one uh, is not interested in training. Or it implies that maybe one is not ready to give up um, the things that are, are holding one back. And so the question of readiness is it's an encouragement to, 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 for us to ask ourselves, like, are we, are we there? Are we committed? Are we um, able to bring up that interest in, in training ourselves, in bettering ourselves, in encouraging ourselves towards wholesome actions? Um, so that, so that when, when we do that, then we have the likelihood of being able to see clearly, to gain wisdom, to understand the Buddha's teachings on dukkha and what causes dukkha. And of course, that if we understand the cause of dukkha as desire, then we can see that there can be a relinquishing of that, a letting go of desire, and a surpassing of desire, and an ending of it. And I've seen in, in my monastic training that um, One of the core principles is, is essentially around letting go. And letting go of what it is that we think uh, we already know. And the sense is if you, if you, aren't, if you aren't ready to let go, um, then you can't really learn uh, very much. If you're going to hold to your, your views very strongly, your ways of doing things. If you can't uh, see that uh, a teacher who is uh, interested in, in training and helping has something to teach after so many years and to look for those positive qualities um, that not only are, are great teachers like Lumpur Pasano and um, many of the teachers in our tradition but uh, just even your fellow monastics. And then as well, if we look at the Vinaya, then it's, it's not just monastics, it's, it's pretty much anyone who um, has some wisdom to pass on. So we're all essentially training each, you know, ourselves and we're training ourselves by um, paying attention to others. Paying attention to what each of us uh, has to teach each other. And that's not easy because uh, what's much easier is to, to follow our, our ingrained views, our perceptions, our own desires, and, and especially with the fact that what we often find because we, we give in to these worldly winds around praise and blame is we don't, we'd rather not hear someone um, say something to us because uh, that, that would actually suggest that something we're doing is is um, not in our best interest. And we might be able to do it differently. Um, and that would be more helpful. Ironically, it's, that's, that's not what's seen. What's seen is often is I'm, uh, I've made a mistake, therefore I'm a bad person, and uh, I shouldn't make mistakes. Um, or we think it's not a mistake. The person who's speaking to me is just, they're actually a mistake. and. Uh, they're not helpful at all, and on the mind goes. So the Buddha talks about this as, 
a reception of a precious gem when, when people are willing to, to offer us feedback. And we should look at it like it's uh, um, like, like one would hold a, a gem that you're discovering and, and, and look at it, wow, it's is so precious, it's so amazing. Which is uh, quite the opposite of sometimes our, our reactions to, to receiving feedback. But that's just, that's just one part of the training. I mean, I, I'm thinking of this in terms of the, the resistance, for example, I felt when I was, um, and still do feel, uh, quite early in training. I remember there was a time that Ajahn Lumpur Pasano was um, getting ready for a sabbatical and Ajahn Amaro had not come back from his sabbatical and then there was a period of time that they had a few months of overlap, as I remember, and then Lumpur Pasano left for about a, a year and a few months and Ajahn Amaro then um, was the, the sole abbot for that time. And I ended up um, being able to drive him on, on many trips. I was one of the only uh, drivers in the monastery at that time. And I, I, I have this distinct memory quite early on when we were together and we were sitting at a, um, a table in a, in a restaurant and a meal was, was bought for us and uh, I ordered some kind of sandwich. Uh, and those of you who know Ajahn Amaro well um, probably know where this story is going. And, uh, and so I just um, was a new Anagarka and I just... And he started to eat, which I didn't pay attention to much. And that was uh, one of the things you learn in your training, is observe, observe your teacher. So I, I picked up the sandwich and I started to eat it, as anybody normally would. And he said, Anagarka Lee, um, maybe you're not, you're not aware, but the, the proper way to eat a sandwich is, is with a fork and knife as a monastic. And my reaction to that was, um, in my mind, you've got to be kidding me. You know, why, why would, why? it's a sandwich. <laughs> Who eats a sandwich with a fork and knife? Luckily, I, um, I was a bit more restrained in body, so I, and, and in that particular day on, in speech. So I just said, okay, and I um, begrudgingly tried to cut the uh, sandwich up with a, a knife and fork and we, we ate together that way. And that was my lesson from, from Ajahn Amaro. And the first of, of many, uh, where he would, he would point out, just point out things to me. And I, and I just remember that, that resistance, that tendency towards resistance, and it, it, it caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of dukkha for me because um, I, did, I did definitely see that it wasn't just a sense of, I didn't agree with, with, with the training. The training was fine, the, the, even that, that particular um, suggestion. It, it just doesn't matter really how you eat a sandwich. It's just a, uh, a particular way Ajahn Arm was pointing out to. But the, the pointing out to it was indicating to me, my resistance around it was indicating that I wasn't, I wasn't as, when Propasana was asking, ready to train because of that, that strength of resistance, that strength of um, wanting to say, I know what's right. You know, I'm like a 30 year old man, you don't need to tell me how to eat a sandwich. Or just fill in the blank with whatever, whatever it is. And, you know, our, our Vinaya actually allows one to eat a sandwich with our hands. Um, but this was Ajahn Amaro's particular training. And this is what he was, what he was pointing out. And what, I, what, I, what I've found and reflected on over the years is it, it doesn't really matter uh, the suggestion about how somebody is, is, is uh, um, encouraging you to do a particular act. It's just all, almost always comes back to, uh, you know, are you willing to train? Are you willing to let go of your belief in, well, I know and this is who I am and I've got it right and nobody needs to tell me. Um, how to train, because, uh, or just the, the resistance to a, a particular way. 
And it's, um, it's similar to, well, it's the same, I think, in, the, in this excellent metaphor that Ajahn Kurnadamo talked about with this um, vegetable peeler, this automatic machine. It, uh, I think it was Amravati, although he was a chitter, so it's possibly a chitter. But it was, a, it was a very big machine. If you imagine a, um, just the drum of a, a washing machine that's a top loader, and you, you drop in, you know, like the machine wasn't quite that big, but you drop in like 20, 20 potatoes, 30 potatoes. And, and inside that washer, there are kind of razor sharp edges. And as the, as the potatoes or whatever vegetable you put in are, are hitting each other, then all the skin's kind of getting worn off. And it was a great metaphor because in a monastery, that's what's, what's continually happening. You're interacting with people, and um, it's not necessarily always pleasant, especially when uh, you're, if you're willing to train, people are suggesting there's another way to do it or possibly do it this way. Or just if you're willing to train by just observation, which is our really our path here uh, as practitioners, is to observe and to see what is the proper behavior. What's the right thing to do? How does my teacher do this? And so, yeah, that, that kind of like the potato kind of, you know, the, the skin, the, the coarseness, the, um, the stuff you don't want, it just gets kind of smoothed away. Uh, and there's, there's that kind of rubbing against uh, the people you live with and you, 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 you absorb the training in that way. Um, you get to see things from a different perspective. I remember um, there's, a short, there's a few months Ajahn Kaspo and I were um, on Agarikas together um, before he became a Salmonera. And he, um, he, he's, he's, he's very similar to the time he was then uh, in, in certain ways. And um, he could see things quite clearly around just how, to, how things would be sort of properly done. Um, in, a, in a sort of like, well, just with everything pretty much. So he, uh, he could just see like, this is how best to put a bag in a garbage can or to uh, wash the dishes in this way or that way. So um, he would uh, not be um, too afraid to, to suggest that the things I was doing were maybe not in the, uh, in the, in the best way. And, and I would often say back to him, I'd say, well, okay, you have your way of doing it, and I have my way of doing it. And uh, I think he might remember the refrain, refrain he would say back to me, which is saying, well, it's, that's true, that's true, but my way is better. And uh, sorry, this is being recorded, but um, I have to admit his way was <laughs> almost always better. But that, but that, I could see that there was a sense of, again, that resistance, like, um, to, to, to allowing, allowing whatever it is he was suggesting, say, okay, well, maybe, maybe he has a point here. Maybe there's something I can learn, rather than just thinking that what I'm doing is better. And, and so when I was you know, doing well with that, then I could see just through observation, okay, he, uh, it was Anagarka Ming An at the time, was doing a particular thing. I said, well, I can, I can learn from that. Um, and so over and over again, in a monastery, it's, it's so useful and so helpful to open the eyes to see very clearly how are other people doing things? What are they doing? Is it skillful? And, you know, and, and, and how can I be more skillful? And then there's a lot of ways that it's just, it's not very clear, like, why particular people do things. Um, and we see things... Later on, I was giving an example to the Anagarkas around when I was an Anagarka, and, and, I, and I wasn't picking up, like, why, um, you know, I was just drying my, my bowl on the, on the um, when, when I was uh, sitting on my haunches on my uh, knees and the, the back of my heels, and I would dry the Anagarka bowl that way. And, and um, I wasn't, I don't think anybody told me, but then later on, um, I found out that was a rule in the Vinaya that you had to be 
quite careful about how you dried your bowl and um, it had to be what's that is in your lap or at least close to the ground in case you dropped it. So that was a training that was just being absorbed, but it wasn't until later that I understood, oh, I see, I get, I get it, I understand now what the purpose of this is. And so over and over again, we have a potential to, to see clearly you know, what it is that um, we're doing in our own behavior that is causing us trouble, is causing, causing difficulty, um, agitation, fear, worry, um, or, that, or that kind of strength of view that I'm speaking about. And then, and then we see that when we're able to um, actually allow ourselves to drop whatever it is that we're holding on to, whatever behaviors we're holding on to, um, by body, speech, or mind, um, a particular way we're thinking about something, obsession we have, um, something that we think is the, the proper way of, of doing a particular uh, task in the monastery, whatever it might be, we're open to that just being um, possibly done in a different way. A way that uh, if, we're, if we're actually observing, we might say, oh, everybody else is actually doing it this way. Um, I've been the odd man out. I haven't, I haven't seen that clearly. I was just kind of paying attention to the, the fact that I just I like doing it my way. And we can be, you know, we can be open to how other people are teaching us. Um, the little lessons that other monastics uh, or, or anybody, anybody who's living in the monastery is, uh, has for us. I remember another time with um, Hutchin Kasapo, I was, I was washing, um, I was washing something in, in the, the sinks that are, the same sinks that are in the, um, the monk's room, the bowl washing room. And I happened to, to be washing it and, and uh, the water was running and I wasn't using it. And Ajahn Kaspa walks by, I think I was probably a Samanera, maybe it was a first Ponsa Bhikkhu or I was not a guy, I can't remember, but he, he just reaches, he walks quickly by, reaches over and, um, and he, uh, he slams the handle down of the faucet, stops the water from running. And, uh, and then, he, and then he, he walks right past me, he's gonna walk out the door and I, and I, was, I got quite upset uh, by that. And I said, you know, I said, hey, please, don't, don't ever do that to me again. You know, took it very personally. And he looked at me with this quizzical look and then walked out the door. And uh, yeah, I was, I was very angry. Um, in, in my mind, I was, you know, I'll run the water if I want to run the water, whatever it is that came up. And later, you know, later I, it was possibly the next day or later that day, I was reflecting and, and feeling remorse for the amount of anger I felt for what seemed like a, um, an abrupt, but, uh, but a, a, a training, a good teaching. You know, if you're not using the water, you're, you're washing something, you're doing something, but the water's just running there. You know, you can, uh, you can conserve that. You don't need to use that. You can be frugal. So I went and I apologized to him and I said, you know, I'm sorry I got so angry. You know, I was, I was, I actually was quite angry and um, I was sorry about that. And, uh, and he's listening and I said, you know what? Uh, one of the, um, one of my girlfriends actually did that to me once and I was, I was very offended. And, um, and I, you know, I just kind of, it just reminded me of that situation so much that there was like, it just felt kind of disrespectful and, and not very kind. And, and, uh, and he, he started shaking his head and he said, that's amazing. And I look at him and I said, I know, isn't it, isn't it just like, I mean, you know, you, you have a girlfriend, you, she should be kind and nice and, you know, communicate in a more nice way. And I said, oh, no, 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 I think you misunderstand me. 
I think it's amazing that you still haven't learned. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think a little bit of anger came back. In that moment. <laughs> um, but he was right. You know, he was right. And uh, like the same situation is going to happen again. I'm going to get angry again. And that's, you know, that's really, that's clearly the training, the, the sense of, oh, right, okay, I'm here to end that dukkha, to not get involved in these sort of like petty ways of, of thinking, of relating to my own experience. And, and, you know, it just comes back to me, me, me. Whereas like, okay, there was a message there. It might have been more abrupt than I would have appreciated, but it was a message nonetheless. Like, you know, be careful, be heedful with uh, how you're using um, material requisites, things that we have. And so it's, it's just an opportunity, this, this sense of training, the sense of, of welcoming um, those potentials within our, our, our own behavior and what it is we're doing. Um, to change, to, to also see that when they change, um, then they're, they're usually for the better. We can trust that, that sense of, uh, of looking after uh, our behavior, what it is that we do, as something, well, how can I, how can I sort of Im improve this and understand I'm, how I'm causing myself dukkha? And the problem uh, often um, is that if we're, not, if we're not clearly open to that as a training, then we can continue to make the same mistakes over and over again for years and years, living in a monastery or not. Even if the ethos is, as it is here, to really, really open yourself up to uh, the potential to, to see how you cause yourself dukkha and how to end that. And so we can get stuck in, in a lot of ways. We can. Um, make ourselves very comfortable. I remember very early on in my training, uh, I got to know Lumpur Pasano in a way that I was, I was not expecting. And uh, we were at, uh, we were um, kind of, people, uh, the monks were coming in for um, for the meal, and um, and so I came in. I was I was an anagaric at that time, or samanera. I think I was a samanera, and uh, Lumpur Pasano had just come back and ordained me as a samanera. And um, for some reason, I I got it in my mind that I didn't. So that you know, the, um, we were about to chant the the Anamodana, but there was some time that wasn't it wasn't quite happening yet. And I got it in mind. Well, I don't wanna disturb him, like kind of ask a question at tea time, I'll just ask a question right now. See if uh, he's willing to just answer it now. There's not much going on. on and it's not going on. So I said, um, Lumpur Pasno, can I ask you a Finaya question? And he didn't know me well enough because if he did, he would have said no um, at that point, uh, I think. And so he said, okay. I said, well, you know, I understand um, that that you know when we have pujas, you know, we have uh, we have these straw mats, these little blue straw mats, and they're quite thin. And you know, the other the monks are sitting on these kind of these more thicker mats, and um, so I I've been sitting on two of the blue mats. And some of the monks have told me that you know that that's not really appropriate. I shouldn't be sitting on on two mats. There's a there's a sort of a, a practice we do is. Um, with the particular layers and this and that, and not sitting on it. And um, I'm probably, at that point, not catching uh, Lomprabhasana's expression that this is not, maybe I should stop talking. And, uh, and, and I said, so, so what's the deal here? I mean, can I, can I sit on these two mats? Or like, I mean, are these monks right or are saying this? And, and he just looked at me and he said, well, if that's what all of you are talking about in the back of the, the monks room there, um, then I think it's, it's, it's pretty much a, a worthless conversation or something like that. And I said, oh, okay, uh, I guess uh, I, I'll take that as your answer to my question then. And, 
which didn't answer my question uh, in the way I wanted it to. So I thought that was the end of it, but it wasn't. And uh, like I said, I wasn't, I, I thought Lumpropasna was this teddy bear. And, uh, you know, you could just, he just, he really wouldn't, you know, kind of uh, give you a hard time at all. Or, uh, or really, you know, there, would, there wouldn't be any kind of, of edged training or a sense of like, let me tell you that maybe you're making a big mistake here. And uh, I, I walked out of the room and I, I came over, I think, to either get his bowl or I, I was walking over and, and he said, um, Chunda, come over here. And I said, okay. And he said, what did, what did you think that, um, that I meant uh, when I responded to your, your question? And unfortunately, for some reason, at that point, I kind of <clears throat> cleared my throat and and I was, uh, I, I kind of put my hands in Anjali and I, and I had some confidence actually. I, I kind of said, you know, oh, I know, I know how to answer this question. And I said, well, you were telling me that, that probably it's not worth, uh, worth really talking about. It's, it's not something that, uh, that we should really kind of think about or, or, um, or put our minds on because it's not, it's not really an important uh, thing to, 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 uh, to bring up. And he said, yes, that's true. But uh, the fact that you brought that up, when you brought that up in front of the lay people, a question like that was, was quite inappropriate. And, uh, and basically, like, it, it just wasn't the time and place for it. And, um, but he didn't say it the way I'm saying it now. <laughs> He said it in a way that, uh, as the Thais would say, you would, as you'd shrink your, your liver would shrink, uh, which mine did. And, uh, and then he said, and, and also, um, your behavior is, is really trying to seek comfort. And, and that's, not, that's not what we're doing here. We're not coming here uh, in the life of monastics to seek comfort and to, to get all of our, our kind of preferences met. And so not only was it an inappropriate time and place for you to ask that question, it was also your general, general behavior is to seek comfort and to, um, to make yourself um, just, just have whatever preferences you want. And this was said in front of a row of onagarkas. And, uh, and I was not... Um, and Lumpur said it with, he was, he was being fierce at the time. He was letting me know that he could see what was going on and uh, that I, I need to actually take it seriously and, and do what I could to, to avoid that kind of behavior. And I was quite embarrassed and, and walked out of the room. And, uh, and that, that teaching has, has stuck with me for my life as a, as a monk, and I've continued to reflect on that. And it doesn't mean I don't make the same mistakes, but um, at the time it was, it was quite, uh, it, it, it actually drove a lot of fear in me. Um, but what was, what was quite nice is that even though in that moment I was, uh, I was struck quite a bit to realize that Lumpur was not indeed a teddy bear, uh, and, and he had something to teach me, and some powerful teachings, and also that he seemed to have my number. And I, I, I remember very distinctly walking outside and, and seeing him come uh, walking into uh, the opposite direction, the direction towards me that I was walking, and I immediately looked away and uh, was quite afraid to look at him. But, but I noticed that he, had a, he, he was walking in a way that, that seemed to indicate that I could look up. And when I looked up, he was actually smiling at me. And, uh, and, I, and I, I looked at him and I said, I'm going to be OK. And he said, are you? And I said, yeah, I think I'm going to be OK. And then he started laughing and walked into the, the dining, what's now the dining hall. And that, you know, that, I didn't want that. I didn't want the, I mean, I was embarrassed. There was all these 
Anagarika is there. And the other thing I didn't, I didn't say is that this was, Ajahn Amar was sitting to Umpropasana's left, and um, he had heard me kind of say this. Um, and and I had been training with Ajahn Amro for a year, and so I noticed that the first thing I did when Lumpur was, was was driving these lessons into me, or dri driving them, to, uh, teaching them to me, I looked up at Ajahn Amro in defense. And I thought, oh, Ajahn Amro will defend me. And he had his arms crossed, and he was looking at me, just like, yeah, just really kind of looking forward to Lumpur letting me have it. And it, it might be also a little hard to understand for those who are not monastics why uh, Lumpur thought that also what I was saying was, was inappropriate in certain ways in the particular time and place that I'd chosen. Um, but it's, it's really a refinement around training, around being very careful on what, you know, what we ask and how we ask and how that asking is. Um, sometimes it's not very inspiring because it, it reveals a, a, a particular way that um, we're trying to get our own way. Um, or, or in this case, I think it was slightly denigrating, you know, what I was, what I was suggesting, was that some other monks had told me I shouldn't be on in this particular way. Is the training really like that? You know, sitting on two layers, what's the deal with that? There was a kind of sense that that's not really the right way to train, and it should be reasonable that if I, if I just want two cushions to sit on, two um, mats to sit on, and they're so thin anyway, what's the big deal? But that, that just, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the teaching. The teaching was to look clearly into what I was trying to get, what I was wanting. And, and I'm so grateful uh, to Lumpur Pasano for uh, being willing to train in that way and not to um, and to say, well, this, <laughs> this summoner is just uh, is useless. It's, it's interesting, too, because in, in our particular training in, the, in this tradition, um, the Ajahn uh, Dick, who's a, a student of Lumpur um, Mahabua's and was his Upatak for almost 20 years, uh, 17, 18 years. Um, he said that when when the um, the monks were were uh, being trained by Lumpur Mahabua, uh, he could he could be really fierce with some of these monks. I mean, you know, kind of yelling at them and kind of really really being so strong with them. And and um, and so what was interesting was that the the lay people who were in the monastery would see this. This is what Ajahn Dick said, and, and he'd say, oh, oh, Lumpur Mahabua must really detest that monk. He's, he's just really giving that monk quite a, a hard time. And uh, it's quite strong the way he's, uh, he's speaking to him. And then they would see um, Lumpur Mahabua, Lungta, uh, being very kind to a particular monk. And there's, oh, he, that monk must be such a good monk. And so just look at how, how sweet he is to that monk. And, and it's funny because um, what Ajahn Dick said was that the monks knew that when Lumpur uh, Mahabua, Lumpur Mahabua would, would be speaking to a monk that way in a, in a very kind way, that, that that monk's days were numbered. He was going to be asked to leave the monastery very soon. And the monks that he was willing to be um, quite strong with, fears. They were the monks who, who he felt were, were quite capable to receive his teachings and he felt very confident in. And in fact, one of the ways that, that's taught in, in the Thai training is that the, the teacher in that way isn't, he's not actually, it's not a personal thing. He's, he's not uh, attacking or, or, or speaking sharply to the student. He's, he's actually speaking sharply to their defilements, their greed, hatred, and delusion. And he's, he's trying to, to sort of help that student eradicate those. But the, the interesting perception um, between the monks and the laity was, was so opposite. And uh, though the monks probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to be that particular monk that was being spoken fiercely to, they saw that, oh, well, Ta really 
he really respects that monk and he, he trusts him. And the one that he's speaking so kindly and sweetly to is he doesn't trust him. He's, he's given up on him. He sees that he's inca- incapable of training. So the, the training, it, it, takes, it takes many particular avenues in a monastery. It takes uh, many particular ways that uh, people are able to, to lend themselves to the, the possibility of change, um, the possibility of, of understanding. And so it's, it's also very often, as, as, I've, as I was pointing out, you know, just observing our own behavior and observing others, how it is that we are capable of, of seeing um, what's the right thing to do. You know, is Anagarika Mingang, Mingang's suggestions to me really that this is the better way? Is that, is that true? And it's, it's for each of us to investigate what is, what is the correct way of doing something? What's the better way of doing something? And sometimes it's, it's just to go against our views and opinions to, to say, oh, this isn't worth it to just hold on to this. There's a, a, a sort of almost silly uh, one of these trainings that uh, particular in the monastery, we, we've heard this before, is sort of um, you, the monks need to be quite careful with their bowls. Uh, our bowls are our livelihood, and from the Buddhist time, they've, they have become a lot stronger. They're stainless steel, um, but we still don't want to think, well, they're stainless steel, I can just kind of abuse them, or, or they can take a little bit more of um, harshness. They were made of clay at the time, or iron, and um, so one of the, one of the uh, what we call korwats, or etiquettes, in the monastery when we're washing bowls is, um, has always been to use, um, we use a sponge. In Thailand, they often, often use just sort of a, a piece of cloth that the monks have, like a, called a mouth cloth or something. It's like a napkin, but it's a piece of cloth. And you'd wash your bowl with that. So they don't, I don't think the sponges are used as often, but we use sponges. And these sponges tend to have a green side that's quite rough. And so there's this, there's this sense don't use the rough side on the on the bowl um, you know the green side on on the bowl whether it's inside or outside or whatever and uh, and it is as Ajahn Yannico mentioned when he was talking about this several months ago he said it's amazing how many views and opinions can be around this um, you say well the green side after a while it gets soft and it doesn't really matter or we can say, um, well, I want to, you know, the inside of the bowl doesn't matter because that's not what's showing. And it, it, how do you get the food out? Um, others say, well, the, the food's never really usually stuck on that much. You don't need to use the green side. And on and on it goes. And it's it's such an excellent reflection because it just it just doesn't matter, you know. Our our different ideas. You use the green side, the yellow side. The, I mean, the the sponge side, or the abrasive side. Um, we can come up with so many different ideas and excuses, and um, even even the fact that it started happening. Ajinyanaku informed me. Well, actually, one of the monks had a pretty strong opinion about it, so he was telling everybody use the green side on the inside and the soft side on the outside, and and uh, it just seems so silly to hear it, you know. But the 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 training and all of that is: can we let go of our our view and opinion about it? Because the abbot of the monastery said, don't do it. Don't use the green side anymore. And it's just, it's just really interesting because that, it, as I said, it's not really that important of a, a job. A, a, you know, oftentimes it is soft. After you use it for a while, it's not. But, um, but it's our views and opinions that are, that are the main training here. It's whether we're, we're willing to let go of those. Say so like, well, yeah, I guess it doesn't really matter that much for me to to continue doing it the way that I want to do it, and why can't I just do it the way that uh, the abbot is suggesting? And so that that training really allows us to see, like, oh yeah, I guess I guess the reason I don't want to do it, or this might be for for someone, 
is that I just, I just think that my way is, um, is the way I want to do it. And that, that's what I'm going to hold on to. But unfortunately, the more that we hold on to that, then the more we train ourselves in just following our own particular preferences and ways. You know, we sit on two mats rather than one, or whatever it is. And if, we, if we're willing to, to, to let go of the view, then we see that, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether, um, you know, it's, it's probably not gonna make a huge difference how you use a sponge, but the view is a huge difference. That tenacity towards me and my way is what really, unfortunately, goes against um, proper training. And so that's what we're, we're training ourselves in. We're training ourselves in letting go and seeing how we're clinging and seeing how that is clinging is causing us dukkha. And how when we're, we're holding on to our particular ways of doing things, we're just leading ourselves onward against the Dhamma, not, not towards the Dhamma. So the... I'll just end here with, um, with a very short story on a Vinaya class that we had uh, several years later after I was uh, a monk for, I don't know, four or five years. And we were sitting in the, in the class and, and somebody um, having uh, you know, observed the fact that Ajahn Amaro um, eats a sandwich in a particular way and Lumpur Pasano actually doesn't eat the sandwich in the same way. It's the same as we would see every day that Ajahn Amaro would walk in and his Sangati, this rope here, would be sitting on the left and he'd put it on and he'd bow. And Lumpur Pasano would leave his Sangati there and, and he would uh, bow, and then he'd put his sankati on. And as, as the students said, oh, what, which do I do? I'm not sure. Who do I follow? Which co-abbot do I follow? And so one of, uh, one of the monks asked, like, so what, what is the proper way of eating a sandwich in the monastery? And Lumpur Pasan was sitting there, Ajahn Amaro was sitting there next to each other. And Ajahn Amaro, I think, lifted his finger, leaned in, opened his mouth, and Lone Propasano said, there are actually two ways of eating a sandwich. And Ajahn Amaro leaned back, closed his mouth, and um, you know, put his, his hands in his lap. And he said, there's my way and there's Ajahn Amaro's way. And Ajahn Amaro suggests that you use a fork and knife or you, you, if, you know, if, you're, if you're out, but if you're just eating there with your bowl, we have a spoon, break up the sandwich in your bowl and, and you eat it in pieces. But there's my way, which is, um, I find how we are, we're in America, and in America, you eat a sandwich with your hands and you pick it up and you put it into your mouth, as most people do. And uh, that's allowed by Vinaya. And, uh, it's fine to do it both ways. And so I, I think, I don't think Ajahn Amaro actually wanted to, <laughs> that to be uh, said because I, I think he, would, he taught all of us at the time, this is the proper way to eat a sandwich. But that was the beauty of the, that co abbotship is that there was, there was this letting go and there was this sense of uh, adapting to each other. I would say that was one of only, I think, three times in about five years that I saw um, Lumpur Pasno um, suggest that there was a different way that Ajahn Amara was, which was the incredible beauty of the, the deference um, that Lumpur Pasno made to Ajahn Amara being the co-abbot. And it was an incredible beauty for us as uh, Lumpur Pasno's and Ajahn Amara's students to see that even though Lumpur Pasno was five years senior um, and he could, um, by the way we do things, kind of just say, well, Ajahn Amaro, um, I'm sort of the senior monk here, so this is how I want things to be. And he never, it, it just, it basically never came out that way. It was a sense of supporting each other, and in all these cases, just, just seeing again and again that, that beauty of, 
of letting go of, of views, letting go of opinions, of harmony, of carefulness. Um, and then we saw that's the proper way to train. We observed two teachers interacting with each other, very different monks, very different monks, and blending together like, like milk and honey. And so through that observation, through seeing like he's this truly beautiful uh, way of, of interacting as, as our teachers, um, by observing that and seeing that, then we could bring that into our own relationships in the monastery with our fellow monastics, with the, the, the guests, the residents that live here. And so we have that opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, to just see clearly what it is that helps with training ourselves to understand the teachings of the Buddha. And to say, oh, well, maybe I can just drop that thing that I keep holding on to that actually I know is causing me a lot of dukkha. And then when we do, we gain an incredible amount of confidence in our own abilities to to see clearly what it is that is the right thing for me to do. Because usually we know it. And that's how wisdom is gained. Because hopefully what is, what is clearly seen is that the, uh, there is a, a letting go of dukkha and a decrease in dukkha and an arising of the wholesome and in a, a clear knowing, a clear seeing. And we, we begin to uh, and we're able to trust ourselves more. Trust in the training, trust in the practice, trust in the Buddha's teachings, trust in our teacher's teachings. And stop trying to kind of get in the way of all of that with our sort of some pettiness or our views and opinions or our own ideas of what should or shouldn't be. And then we see that the things that we thought would make us happy, which are our own preferences, actually cause us this dukkha. And if we just let go and, and move towards that, that sense of training ourselves well, properly, and letting go, then that's where true happiness can arise. That's where we see that, that dukkha truly can change. <clears throat> 